All right, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. All right. Thank you for joining us for Grand Rounds today. We're going to go ahead and get started again. Thank you. We're going to have Dr. Armitage, who's going to introduce the topic and our speaker to us today. So, um, good afternoon. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Keith Armitage from the Department of Medicine. Um, among my roles, I'm the, uh, the co-chair of the anti-infective utiliz anti -infective utilization and quality assurance committee. Tracy, I'm the co-chair with Tracy Omanovich. Nan Wang is our farm D who really runs the committee and tells Tracy and I what to do, which is fantastic. Um, and for about the last year, um, uh, we've been discussing appropriate use, uh, about, we've been discussing bringing the procalcitonin test in-house. Actually, Dr. Sagrellis, who is our um, Anamarcova stewardship person, kind of was championing this idea. And so about a year ago or, or so, and um, the, the lab, you know, put in a capital request to purchase a machine that would allow us to, to do procalcitonin in-house. Having procalcitonin as a send-out test is pretty crazy, right? Doesn't really help you make a clinical decision if it takes three days. Um, so the machine is here and the lab is geared up to do procalcitonin. And, and I know Dr. Schmatz is not here. I think they'll do it once a day or twice a day. I don't know if it's once a day. Yeah, that's the current plan. And so we've been having a lot of discussion about, about appropriate use of, of this test, under what circumstances. We didn't want to just add the test to our options and have people just kind of order it on a whim, just, oh, let's get a CRP, let's get a procalcitonin. We want to look at, look at the data. And, you know, in the era of choosing wisely, we're trying to use, you know, and, and just for the people in back, there's plenty of seats up front, so don't be shy. I've, I've always wanted to say that as the Grand Rounds introducer. Um, so we've been having a lot of discussion about about um, how we should use procalcitonin at this hospital. You know, you know, we see a lot of patients that come in from community hospitals, and it's use, you know, some ERs use it on a lot of patients to decide if they're infected or not. Some hospitals use it as part of a sepsis screen, and and it's not clear that there's any data to support that. So, on our committee, you know, we've been debating, we've been having conference calls, trying to roll out procalcitonin whether we're going to um, restrict it to the ICUs, because that's the data is. So in one of our discussions, Dan, Dr. Dan Rhodes, who works in medical microbiology, told me that um, Noah Hassan, who is a third-year um, pediatric ID fellow, had given a presentation uh, in Rainbow on appropriate use of procalcitonin, and I said, yes. And then, um, and then the same week, I had our Grand Rounds speak for today canceled. And, and, and I also scheduled Grand Rounds. This is like, you know, a very happy circumstance. So um, I contacted Noor, and she she graciously agreed to give a presentation on, on procalcitonin. And you know, um, uh, I think for a third year fellow to do that is fantastic. Um, so I asked Noor what I should say about her. She said nothing. But um, I know Noor did her pediatric residency in American University of Beirut, and she's been here for three years. And thank you so much for doing this and and, and addressing this topic and helping inform our discussion. So I give you the floor. Yep. Thank you very much, Dr. Armitage. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Today I'll be talking about new applications of procalcitonin in our clinical practice. And as we all know, for decades, procalcitonin was only thought of as a precursor of calcitonin, which is a hormone mainly involved in calcium hemostasis. However, recently, procalcitonin has gained much attention as a serological marker of sepsis and as a biomarker to guide the duration of antibiotic therapy. So let's see how procalcitonin got its new job. So in the 70s, the great endocrinologist, Dr. Kiskus, and his colleague, Dr. Roos, first identified procalcitonin as a precursor of calcitonin. A few years later, a group of researchers in one of the largest cancer centers in Europe who were um, interested in tumor markers noted that procalcitonin was especially increased in patients with small cell carcinoma of the lungs, suggesting the neuroendocrine cells of the lungs as a probable site of procalcitonin production. For several years after that, research with procalcitonin was abandoned until three months before the Gulf War, when a group of French Army physicians um, investigated markers of severe lung injury, um, secondary to inhalation of toxic gases. And after a few months with studies with burn patients, 
they noted that some patients have very high levels of procalcitonin compared to other patients. And when they went to these patients' charts, they noted that all of these patients had suffered from severe sepsis or septic shock. And that's what first drew attention to the possible relationship between procalcitonin and sepsis. To confirm this relationship, a group of French pediatricians um, evaluated procalcitonin levels in a group of pediatric patients with different infections. And they noted that patients with severe bacterial infections had very high levels of serum procalcitonin compared to those who had no signs of infections. And that serum procalcitonin in these patients decreased rapidly with antibiotic therapy. On the other hand, patients who had um, bacterial colonization, local infections, or viral infections did not have a significant elevation in procalcitonin levels. And these data were published in the Lancet Journal in 1993. And this is the first article officially linking procalcitonin to sepsis. And that's how this hormone became a marker of sepsis. So where is procalcitonin produced? So in healthy, uninfected subjects, procalcitonin is mainly produced from the parafollicular cells of the thyroid and to a lesser extent from the neuroendocrine cells of the lungs. And it's just an intermediate uh, in procalcitonin synthesis, so it's immediately processed into calcitonin. That's why in healthy, uninfected subjects, procalcitonin levels are only uh, are very low or undetectable. And the calcitonin gene is usually located on chromosome 11, and it's only activated or expressed in the parafollicular cells of the lungs until a lesser extent in the neuroendocrine cells of the, uh, sorry, parafollicular cells of the thyroid until a lesser extent from the neuroendocrine cells of the lungs. And with bacterial infection, that there is an upregulation in calcitonin gene expression in all cell types. So there is a constitutive release of procalcitonin from all tissue and cell types throughout the body. So under septic conditions, the whole body could be seen as an endocrine gland secreting procalcitonin. Um, so the inflammatory release of procalcitonin in bacterial infection can be induced either directly via microbial toxins endotoxin, especially endotoxin, or um, via um, release of cytokines, especially interleukin-1, TNF-alpha, and interleukin-6. On the other hand, in viral infection, procalcitonin transcription is attenuated by the cytokines released during viral infection, especially interferon gamma. And that's why procalcitonin is usually elevated in bacterial infection, but not in viral infection. Procalcitonin can also be increased in sterile tissue damage, such as large myocardial infarction, liver necrosis, extensive burns, or um, trauma um, injury. And this is believed to be secondary to the host response to mitochondrial DNA. As millions of years ago, mitochondria were believed to be a saprophytic bacteria that eukaryotic cells captured during evolution. And thus, the circular DNA of the mitochondria still retains some characteristics of the bacterial DNA. That's why the release of the mitochondrial DNA that happens in tissue damage might initiate an inflammatory response so similar to that um, that's seen in bacterial infection. Now, what's the normal level of procalcitonin in healthy subjects? We mentioned that before. So procalcitonin is immediately converted into calcitonin. That's why in healthy subjects, procalcitonin is below level of detection. Now, to understand procalcitonin dynamics, they injected healthy subjects with bacterial endotoxin, just a safe dose of bacterial endotoxin, and then they followed um, um, the level of procalcitonin. So we can see that at zero, one, and two hours, procalcitonin was undetectable, and then it became detectable at four hours, peaked at six hours, and then plateaued at eight to 24 hours. Um, this is another case of iatrogenic sepsis when patient was accidentally injected with a senatobacter. We can see that procalcitonin was undetectable at one and a half hour, became detectable two and a half hours, and then peaked at 13.5 hours. So if you measured procalcitonin early in the course of infection, you might get, you might get a falsely negative or a falsely low uh, levels of procalcitonin. That's why you should always repeat um, the procalcitonin measurements six to 24 hours after initial measurement to detect the peak. And as I mentioned, procalcitonin peaked at 13 hours and at the same time, TRP was only minimally elevated and it did not peak before um, 30 hours. Now, uh, procalcitonin half-life is believed to be um, 24 hours, meaning that procalcitonin should decrease daily by around 50% if the bacterial infection is controlled. 
So keep that in mind when evaluating response to antibiotics using a uh, change in procalcitonin levels. Now what and what does not increase procalcitonin concentration? So not all bacterial infections are associated with a significant elevation in procalcitonin level. So among bacteria, chlamydia, um, chlamydial infection, mycoplasma infection may not be associated with a significant level, a significant elevation in procalcitonin level. Mycobacteria may or may not elevate procalcitonin level. Also, small, um, not only small, localized chronic fluid collections such as abscesses and empyemas may not be associated with a significant elevation in procalcitonin level. In a series of 18 patients with culture positive empyema, the sensitivity of procalcitonin was only 74%, even using a very low cutoff of 0.19. So that's why you cannot rely on procalcitonin as the only marker to diagnose um, these infections. And the good thing about procalcitonin is that it's not affected by glucocorticoid administration. Now, what's the diagnostic performance of procalcitonin in adults? So um, the predictive um, value of, uh, or performance of procalcitonin to detect or rule out bacteremia was evaluated in this prospective case control study that included 200 hospitalized adult patients. And we can see that at a cutoff of 0.5, the reported sensitivity was only 56% with a specificity of 83%. Lowering the cutoff to 0.2 was associated with an improved sensitivity to 92% at the expense of decreased specificity to 43%. Another study also evaluated diagnostic performance of procalcitonin to differentiate bacteremic from non-bacteremic patients and patients presenting with acute fevers. And we can see that performance um, differ according to the cut of use. So the lower the procalcitonin, the lower the cut of use, the higher the sensitivity. And the higher the procalcitonin is, the higher the specificity. Or in other words, the probability or the likelihood of bacterial infection or bacteremia in this case is higher with higher procalcitonin levels and is lower with a lower procalcitonin level. But there is no cutoff that would give you 100% sensitivity or 100% specificity. So even at a very low cutoff of 0.1, you still miss 10% of the cases of bacteremia. Um, several studies have also evaluated diagnostic performance of procalcitonin to differentiate between sepsis um, from um, systemic inflammatory response syndrome of non-infectious origin in critically ill patients. And these studies were pulled in the systematic review that was published in 2013. Several cutoffs was used um, in these studies, but the pooled sensitivity was 77% and the pooled specificity was 79%, so moderate diagnostic performance. Now for community-acquired pneumonia. So this study evaluated diagnostic performance of procalcitonin in adult patients admitted to the hospital with suspected community-acquired pneumonia. So it included 393 patients with uh, respiratory symptoms and infiltrates and chest X-ray. 20 patients were proven to have a non-infectious origin of the chest infiltrates, while 373 were confirmed to have community-acquired pneumonia. Among those with confirmed pneumonia, 24 patients improved without antibiotics, suggesting a viral etiology. And um, uh, in the uh, 98 patients, bacterial um, etiology um, was confirmed. And for this analysis, peaks of procalcitonin were included in the analysis. So we can see on the left side, we can see performance of procalcitonin and other markers to differentiate pneumonia from non-infectious infiltrates. On the right side, we see um, um, performance of procalcitonin and other markers to differentiate bacterial pneumonia from non-infectious infiltrates and from non-bacterial infectious etiology. And in both situations, procalcitonin was better than CRP, which is the dark um, curve here, and better than what the um, um, white count for differ in differentiating pneumonia from non-infectious infiltrates or differentiating bacteria from non-bacterial infectious etiology. So procalcitonin has an area under the curve of 85% and CRP had an area of 73% under the curve, which was statistically significant. And then they reported um, specificities and sensitivities according to the cutoff use. So we can see that for a cutoff 0.1, 
there is a sensitivity of 90% and a negative likelihood ratio of 0.25. So let's see that you have a patient presenting with respiratory symptoms and um, with uh, infiltrates on the chest X-ray. And based on your assessment, based on other lab markets, you suspect that his, the probability of pneumonia is 30%. Now you measure procalcitonin as less than 0.1. So you have a like, negative likelihood ratio of 0.25 which would decrease your post-test pro probability to 9%. Let's say that you have another patient and presenting with infiltrate respiratory symptoms. You suspect um, a diagnosis of pneumonia at 70%, probability of pneumonia at 70%. And then you measure the procalcitonin, it's above one, so that's associated with a positive likelihood ratio of 3.3. So that would increase your post-test probability from 70% to almost 90%, and that's how we should use procalcitonin. So it should be used as an adjunctive to your clinical judgment, other lab marker, but by itself, it's not 100% um, accurate in ruling in or ruling out bacterial infection. This is another study evaluating adult patients treated in, um, for lower respiratory tract infection in an outpatient setting. And for patients with confirmed pneumococcal infections, um, 25% of them had a procalcitonin below the level of detection, while only 50% had a procalcitonin level above 0.08. Also, in patients with mycoplasma infection, 90% of them had a procalcitonin below the level of detection, while only 9% had a procalcitonin above the level of detection. So you can see that procalcitonin might be limited in some situations. So overall, as a diagnostic marker, Procalcitonin is not sufficiently reliable to be the sole marker of bacterial infection, but it'd rather be used in conjunction with the clinical judgment and other um, lab markers. Now, can we use procalcitonin um, safely to guide um, antibiotic therapy in patients with respiratory tract infections? So this was a Cochrane review that was published in 2017, and it assessed the safety and efficacy of using procalcitonin for starting or stopping antibiotics over a large range of patients with varying severity of acute respiratory infections and from different clinical settings, primary uh, setting, ED, and intensive care. And they included randomized controlled trials that compared procalcitonin-guided therapy to the usual care. It's, so 26 studies were included, um, accounting for 6,700 participants. Participants have um, different clinical diagnoses lower respiratory tract infection, including community-acquired pneumonia, hospital-acquired, um, and ventilator-associated pneumonia, COPD exacerbation, asthma exacerbation, all kinds of uh, lower respiratory infection. Also included upper respiratory tract infections, including common cold, pharyngitis, tonsillitis, otitis media. Also patients with sepsis and suspected acute respiratory infections were included in this um, analysis. So um, in the procalcitonin arm, all studies almost use this algorithm um, for initiating or um, for cessation of antibiotics in patients um, in this arm. So for initiation, antibiotics were initiated if procalcitonin level was above 0.25. If procalcitonin was below 0.1, there was a strong recommendation against starting antibiotics if it's between 0.1 and 0.25, there is a recommendation against antibiotics. And for those who were started on antibiotics, antibiotics were continued until the absolute value of procalcitonin has decreased to less than 0.25, or it has dropped by at least 80% from the highest measured concentration. So we can see that 8% um, of the patients had upper respiratory tract infection, while the, the remaining patients had lower respiratory tract infection, mainly community-acquired pneumonia, followed by COPD exacerbation, followed by um, hospital and ventilator-associated pneumonia. And the pooled analysis showed that procalcitonin-guided therapy was associated with an improved survival or a better mortality compared to the control group. So there was a 1.4% difference in mortality between the two groups in favor of procalcitonin group. And at the same time, procalcitonin-guided therapy was associated with a 2.4 days reduction in antibiotic um, exposure and was also associated with a decrease in antibiotic-related side effects. And um, on subgroup analysis showed similar results, whether it's according to settings, primary care setting, emergency setting, intensive care setting. 
and also it was similar on subgroup analysis according to the diagnosis, whether it's community-acquired pneumonia, ventilator-acquired um, pneumonia, or um, COPD exacerbation. So it seems that procalcitonin is safe to guide the initiation or cessation of antibiotics um, in patients with lower respiratory tract infections in all clinical settings. And it seems that using a cutoff of 0.25 is safe. And one of the authors commented that a cutoff of 0.25 can be useful in separating the cases of acute respiratory infection that, regardless of etiology, do not need antibiotic treatment, or even if it's due to bacteria, can be treated for a shorter time than usually recommended by the guidelines. However, note that in all the included studies, immunocompromised patients are excluded, so maybe we cannot apply this in immunocompromised in this population. Also, um, it's not clear if these studies have included complicated infections such as empyemas or abscesses. As I mentioned before, procalcitonin may not be elevated in localized or chronic empyemas and abscesses, so using procalcitonin as a solo marker um, to guide antibiotic treatment in these kinds of infections may not be appropriate. All right, let's move to a case. So I have a 60-year-old female presenting shortness of breath, modest hypoxia, bilateral patches on infiltrate on chest X-ray. She has watery yellow chest sputum production. She has an elevated white count but modest left shift, no subjective fevers, and she had initial procalcitonin of 0.25. So based on the algorithms that I mentioned, who would start here on antibiotics and who would, who would start? Can you raise hands? That's the algorithm. All right, so <laughs> no worries, right? <laughs> <That's a laughs> All right, so it's simple. Just look at the algorithm. Point one five. <laughs> All right, so based on this, you may not start antibiotics. However, keep in mind that procalcitonin peaks six to twelve hours after onset of infection. So early procalcitonin level may be negative. So what should be done in this case is that if you have a suspicion of infection, regardless of procalcitonin level, you should initiate antibiotics. And then you should repeat procalcitonin 6 to 24 hours later. So we'll see what happens to this patient. So initial procalcitonin 0 0.15. She has a lactate of 4. So if it was an infection, she would be in sepsis. Um, we repeat procalcitonin 24 hours later, and it went up to 3.8. So this patient definitely needs antibiotics, and we later know that her sputum culture is growing streptomal, so this patient has pneumonia. She was continued in antibiotics, and we can see that procalcitonin is nicely decreasing. Now, another patient, almost similar presentation, almost identical chest X-ray, um, presenting the same presentation as I said. So it could be pneumonia, it could be heart failure, lactate of 3. Her initial procalcitonin was 0 0.1, but we cannot not to start her antibiotics. So we started antibiotics, and then we repeat procalcitonin 24 hours later, and it's below 0 0.1. So now we have two procalcitonin levels that are pristine, less than 0 0.1, so this patient does not need antibiotics, and she improves with um, treatment of her heart failure. And that's the beauty of things. Two patients, almost identical presentation. One needed antibiotics and got them, and one did not need antibiotics, and antibiotics were discontinued after 24 hours. Now. Can we use procalcitonin to guide antibiotic therapy in patients with sepsis or suspected sepsis? Um, in this randomized controlled trial, um, they evaluated the use of procalcitonin to reduce exposure to antibiotics in patients in, uh, admitted in the intensive care units. And, um, they included patients suspected bacterial infections um, who were not receiving antibiotics at the time of inclusion. They excluded pregnant women um, excluded immunocompromised patients, neutropenic patients, um, and patients who had infections where prolonged courses of antibiotics are recommended, such as infective endocarditis, osteoarticular infections, enteromediastinitis, abscesses. Um, they excluded patients with CB, PCP, and toxoplasma. And they asked randomized patients to procalcitonin guided therapy versus the usual care. And they used the following algorithm. So usually patients would be continued on antibiotics until procalcitonin has decreased to less than 0 0.5 or it, has, um, or it has dropped by more than 80% of the peak concentration. 
um, we can see that um, almost 40% in each group were in septic shock and around 17% in each group had a positive blood culture, but they did not report on the pathogens isolated in the blood culture. And as you can see, mortality was not different between the two groups, so no difference in mortality between procalcitonin and guided therapy and the control group. But at the same time, procalcitonin and guided therapy was associated with the um, reduced exposure to antibiotics. Of secondary endpoints such as cure rates, relapse, um, length of hospital or ICU stay were similar in both groups. However, procalcitonin algorithm was not adhered to in around 50% um, of patients in the procalcitonin arm. 14 of them were clinically unstable and they received a prolonged antibiotics beyond the recommended duration despite the procalcitonin <coughs> levels and 39 patients, um, their treating physicians decided to stop antibiotics despite persistently elevated procalcitonin level. However, when they did a subgroup analysis based on algorithm adherence, um, the um, results were similar to the main analysis, so no difference in mortality. They also did a subgroup analysis based on positive blood culture and based on the presence of the septic shock, and also there was no difference in mortality. Um, in this randomized control trial, um, they investigated use of procalcitonin to shorten antibiotic treatment in patients with severe sepsis or septic shock. Also excluded patients Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, Listeria, Legionella, PCB, or Mycobacteria. Um, also excluded patients um, who had infection that um, usually required prolonged courses of antibiotics, such as bacterial endocarditis, abscesses, chronic osteomyelitis, um, and pyemas, mediastinitis, and also excluded immunocompromised patients. Um, so they used the following algorithm. Pro so antibiotics were continued until procalcitonin has decreased to less than 0 0.25 in patients who had an initial procalcitonin above 1, or uh, and until procalcitonin has decreased to less than 0 0.1 in patients who had an initial procalcitonin below 1. So... Here we can see that 11 patients in each group had positive blood cultures, and pathogens were mainly E. coli, strep pneumo, Klebsiella, and other enterobacteriaceae, but only limited number of patients had um, Staph aureus bacteremia, one in the procalcitonin group versus three in the control group. Um, as we can see, procalcitonin was associated with a reduced exposure to antibiotics, with uh, no increased adverse outcomes, so no difference in mortality, cure rate, relapse, length of ICU or hospital stay. And for patients with bacteremia, the 22 patients who had a positive blood culture, the median duration of antibiotic therapy was significantly shorter in patients assigned to procalcitonin as compared with those assigned to the control group. And despite the relatively short duration of treatment in bacteremic patients assigned um, to the procalcitonin group, no cases of recurrence was observed in this study. Several other randomized control trials assessed the safety of procalcitonin to reduce antibiotic exposure, and these studies were pooled in this Cochrane um, um, review that was published in 2017. It included 10 studies accounting for 1,100 patients, and the pooled analysis showed no difference in mortality between the two groups, and at the same time, um, it was procalcitonin-guided therapy was associated with uh, 1.2 days reduction in antibiotic exposure. However, the authors cemented that the quality of evidence is only very low to moderate because of the absence of methods to prevent errors or the absence of information about such methods and because of insufficient numbers of studies and patients per outcome and because most of the authors um, were either consultants or received payments from companies involved in procalcitonin analysis. Other thoughts that I have. So we all know that the combined analysis provides additional statistical power, but may overstate the estimation of effectiveness and magnitude of benefit to the different subpopulation. Or in other hands, some study, in, in other um, words, some studies have excluded patients with a tenetobacter infection, and most of them have included very limited number of patients with staph aureus bacteremia. So will I be able to apply the result of this pooled analysis to this subpopulation, will I be able to say it's safe to use procalcitonin to guide treatment in patients with staph aureus bacteremia? 
I don't think we know. I would like to see a subgroup analysis in patients with staphylococcus bacteremia or in patients with senatobacter bacteremia or in patients with MDR bacteremia to be able to say that it's safe to use procalcitonin um, in these subgroups. Anyway, procalcitonin was approved by the FDA in February 2000, um, uh, 2000, last year, 2017, to guide antibiotic therapy in patients with lower risk respiratory tract infection for initiation or cessation of antibiotics and to guide cessation of antibiotics in patients with proven or suspected sepsis. All right, now, can I use procalcitonin as a prognostic marker? Um, so in this study, um, they evaluated um, the prognostic performance of procalcitonin to predict mortality in patients with severe sepsis admitted to the ICU. And they noted that patients who did not decrease their procalcitonin by more than 80% from baseline to day four has a twofold higher mortality compared to those who decreased their procalcitonin by more than 80% from baseline to day four. And this was true even after, this was an independent factor even after adjusting for confounders. Now, let's move to another case, another scenario. So I have a 60-year-old patient presenting with nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain, abnormal liver function test with an obstructive pattern, white count elevated, lipase is normal, so no pancreatitis, lactate is fixed. We suspect that he has an ascending cholangitis. He was hypotensive, resuscitated with three liters of fluid, and he was started antibiotics after obtaining cultures. Let's see. So initial procalcitonin, 0.2. We don't rely on initial procalcitonin to guide antibiotic therapy, especially in sepsis. We repeat procalcitonin 24 hours later, and it's up to 10.7. 48 hours later, it's still elevated at 10.7, and this is actually okay. Procalcitonin, which is a marker of sepsis, um, will continue to be elevated until we get adequate levels of antibiotics in the tissue, and that usually takes 36 to 48 hours. And then 48 hours later, we can see how procalcitonin is nicely responding. So it's decreased by 50% day three, 50% day four, and then uh, less, more than 50% on day five. So who says that based on procalcitonin uh, response, when can we stop antibiotics? Can we stop them at day four? A little bit too early, so less than 80% reduction. At day five, it's more than 80% reduction, and it's probably safe to stop antibiotics at this uh, point. <laughs> All right, so just um, Keep in mind that procalcitonin may continue to rise 24 to 36 hours after initiation of treatment since it often requires that long for antibiotics to achieve cytal tissue levels. Now another case, patient presenting with two-day history of diarrhea and fever, 70-year-old female or male. He had un recently undergone hip surgery, received perioperative prophylactic antibiotic. He had a distended and tender abdomen, pandemia, tachycardic fever, we suspect that he had a C. diff infection. So he was started on antibiotics uh, for C. diff. Uh, 24 hours later, his initial procalcitonin 15.8, very high. We repeat it 24 hours later, and it's 89. That's expected, that's fine. Then day three started going down to 64. Day four, more than half, 50% uh, reduction. Day five, around 30% um, reduction. Day six, around um, third uh, or 30 percent or less than that reduction in procalcitonin and then it started going up and here we should be concerned that something bad is happening so when procalcitonin is not responding as we expected we should think so think of two things either complications or inappropriate antibiotic use and in this case unfortunately patients had bowel perforation massive peritonitis were unable to control the infection and we can see that her procalcitonin went up to 300, and unfortunately, she expired. Um, so, so sometimes. I can't wait for the discussion. I'm going to argue with Dr. Hajjal. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 
So, so to sum up, uh, procalcitonin can be used to aid decision-making on antibiotics in patients with suspected or confirmed lower respiratory tract infection to aid decision-making in discontinuation of patients suspected or confirmed sepsis, and it also might be used to assess the 28-day uh, mortality in patients with sepsis or septic shock based on change in procalcitonin level over time. And in all cases, procalcitonin should not replace your clinical judgment. That's all what I have. Thank you very much. Question? Just a second. No, I, I, no I, I, I greatly appreciate that. On behalf of the Antimicrobial Utilization and Quality Assurance Committee, which Dr. Lomanovich is co-chair with me, I think. And because we do, I think very soon, probably the next, in, in a week or two, we're going to have our final decision on, on how we're going to use this test, who can order it, under what circumstances they can order it, and how the order is done. For instance, there might be a drop-down box saying you're ordering it to help you stop antibiotics, or you, you're, you know, if we allow this, you're ordering it in some cases, I think maybe limited cases, so if you decide to start antibiotics. So these are some of the ideas, and this, your presentation was really informative, really fantastic. You know, when the Cochrane Collaborator shows a benefit, that means there's got to be a benefit, because Cochrane never shows a benefit to anything. It's a very <laughs> nihilistic process. So, Dr. Joseph had his hand up first. Uh, question. Uh, I, I, I think, I, I don't know if Dan or Michael, no, I, I think I, I, I emailed Dr. Schmatzer, who's the, the clinical micro, or clinical lab person running this, and I don't think she was sure, but I've heard it's around $30. Sounds right, but I don't know. I yeah. think it's around $50 in Cleveland Clinic. It goes $50, yeah, so it's, it's around that. A CRP is not a cheap test either. Um, so, again, I think what, what's proposed here is there, it'll be, a, it'll be a, a done once a day. So, again, if you're, if you're you know, if it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you're meeting a patient with heart failure, infiltrates, and cough, and you're on the fence about to give antibiotics. Not that that would be appropriate anyway, because you know it goes up, but you're not going to get it at 2 o'clock in the morning. So, again, the way that we're rolling it out, I think doing it on a, once a day in-house. Um, and, you know, just as an aside, a lot of people in this room also practice at the VA. The VA it's been a send-out test at the VA for a long time, and I practice at the VA half day a week, and it's always kind of committed to order CRP, because, you know, I'm there Wednesday afternoon, and it'll be back on Monday. Um, to help me government. But I think the VA is going to be doing it in-house any day now, too. I think they're, they're gearing up. So, um, and honestly, and I mean, a lot of people in the room have practiced other, you know, a lot of the fellows have done residencies elsewhere. A lot of hospitals use procalcitonin like crazy. And I think UH and VA are, are not that, it's, you know, not for better or worse, we're a little later than other hospitals in, in, in using this test. Maybe it's overused and not used appropriately elsewhere. But anyway, other discussions? I'm, yep, Rush? Sure. I just thought it was clear that the application of bacteremic or not in that case, but we talked about how... It was septic. So septic. But not bacteremic. Day five, you make a case here that you may stop antibiotics. Correct. So under current, I mean, the current practice, some of these bacteremic damage, bacteremic disease, you know, the is done and you know, source control. Yeah. Would you stop the antibiotic day five or would you do the... Well, the, you know, I don't, there's a, there's a few infections, there's a few infectious doctors in the room. Right. And so, and so let me just say, let me, tell, no, let me tell you, so let, let me tell you about, about length of therapy. So there are some infections where there's good data about length of therapy, endocarditis, you know, some bone and joint infections, et cetera. But for a lot of length of therapy, we just make it up. And so we may say, oh, back, back, yeah, no. <laughs> back to make pyelonephritis, two weeks of therapy. But if we lived in a universe for weeks had six days, we'd still see two weeks of therapy because it sounds right. So I think I think um, I think right my ID calling so you guys you know. No, but I guess the question is that it's a sort of grand round with about procalcitonin binding a new home. So is it a paradigm shift? Are we actually changing duration of therapy based on? Well, the best data. I, I, the, the goal of our antimicrobial utilization and quality assurance committee. Um, <laughs> Is, is appropriate use of antibiotics and really limiting antibiotic use, really, really to limit exposure for resistance, et cetera, cost and exposure. And if this test can be used to help us, you know, stop antibiotics a day or two earlier, and that was the data from Cochrane, right? That Correct. You can stop a day or two earlier. So, I mean, that's a pretty drastic case. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm, but 
And again, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get my spine stronger because Dr. Hajal is about to. But, but um, no, if um, if you had a if you had a patient, a complicated patient in ICU with a lot of things going on, and you start treating them for nosocomial pneumonia, and you're not sure, and after a day or two, the procalcitonin is normal. You know, instead of giving vancomycin or you know vancomycin or daptomycin meropenem, you know, blah blah blah. You know, would that would would a procalcitonin and, and with serial measurements of procalcitonin in a critical care setting where you're not sure if there's a healthcare associated pneumonia or not, help you stop antibiotics earlier? There is no question. By the way, this is a great job. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
It is, I truly believe that we need to have a, a single point in time that we determine that we're really concerned for infection. Whatever we do to decide whether there's an infection or not, add to it procalcitonin and reassess at a later time. Perhaps the reassessment that we're currently doing without procalcitonin is in 48 hours. And, and at that the time... Back, so, yeah. <laughs> and, so I can... Yeah. So, the, so within 48 hours, a determination will occur, we're going to stop antibiotics or not stop antibiotics. But if we add to that, perhaps this time frame on when would it be safe on a repeat test to stop antibiotics, that would be something that we are all interested in. I truly believe in pneumonia, this is a very uh, good data about its use. For abdominal sepsis, I still believe the abdominal exam and abdominal symptoms uh, predate everything, and I, I like serial abdominal exams will always be how we guide therapy for the abdomen. For a septic individual, everybody's going to ignore your procalcitonin when their blood pressure is down in the dumpster. Two days later, if we prove that there is an infection, um, I think a lot of us will shy away from stopping at five days. I do believe there is data about uh, the level, the, the, uh, the severity of the procalcitonin enlargement uh, increase can correlate with gram-negative infections. So if you have very high levels, you can uh, say, oh, I'm dealing with a gram-negative infection, but again, the data is very small. It's going to the severity of infection, but not the, the right. etiology, not exactly. the accident. Well, actually, there's a couple of studies from Europe, if I remember well, that looked at gram-negatives in comparison with others, gram-negative bacteremia that are with, without, uh, that they tend to be a little bit higher. But I mean, and there's, yeah. Live and learn, I think it's a great opportunity yeah. for us to learn yeah. from yeah. Yeah. yeah, just to confirm one point, I don't think it's safe to use procalcitonin to initiate antibiotics yeah. in patients with sepsis or suspected sepsis. But I think data are clear for lower respiratory tract infection that it's safe to use them for initiation of antibiotics. And you don't use only a single measurement. You should repeat that at least 12 to 24 hours after initial measurement to detect the peak. Dr. Tori, and I'll repeat the question. Yeah. So the question is, is this an add-on test? I mean, like if the patient had blood draw in the morning, can we do it as an add-on test? And if a patient comes from a, a, a community hospital in our system... Sometimes we already have multiple time points. Yeah. I, I think, I think um, and, and Dan, Dan and Michael may know, but I, I think the, uh, there was a capital outlay to buy a, a device that measures procalcitonin that is at, at this facility. And I don't know if it will be at other facilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the answer, you know, again, not that re not that relevant to the, our colleagues across the University Circle, but it's a probably good to see here. And then whether, whether, like, if you have a red top or a red green, whether you can call the lab and add it on. Um, I, that, Dr. Schmach is on vacation this week, so she might know that. And Michael or Dan, do you know? Yeah, yeah. But I, I, it's probably a test you can add on. I think it's not, it's not, yeah. So is that, is that Dr. Studio? Yeah. So I have uh, two questions. Uh, what is the role of procalcitonin uh, in uh, inhibiting the growth of non-infectious uh, inflammatory process, say after major uh, abdominal surgery or major cardiothoracic surgery? Um, is it elevated in non-infectious inflammatory process? Second part is, uh, can we use procalcitonin uh, to pick up uh, early post-operative infectious complications where your examination is going to get you only so far because most times it's tender, uh, there's always some food sticks to try to and try to enter into the head, so uh, not a pretty good okay. issue. Is procalcitonin a useful device to pick up early post-operative uh, infectious complications? So the second question was using procalcitonin like in, in, in a post-operative patient to try to early detection. And the first question was... The first question was, uh, is it elevated in non... Oh, that's right, yeah. The first question was uh, other inflammatory conditions 
It's prokaryotes. I, I, I've certainly seen, you know, I had a recent patient with um, rhabdomyolysis that had elevated prokaryotes donor, and I looked it up, and there, there are a variety of inflammatory conditions, so it, the specificity is not perfect, right? Yeah. Correct, correct. So procalcitonin might be elevated in sterile tissue damage, as we mentioned before. So it's, procalcitonin is not 100% specific for infection. It could be in sterile tissue damage. In general, it's not elevated or it's not as high in um, inflammatory conditions compared to patients with infection or sepsis, but it's not 100% uh, specific. So, and there was a systematic review compared, like it studied the um, um, diagnostic accuracy of procalcitonin for post-op infections, and it was only a moderate diagnostic performance, so you cannot use it to 100% rule in an infection or to rule out an infection. And it's really serial measurements in these Correct. Of so, patients. if it's serially negative below level of detection, then the probability of infection is very low. But if you have a procalcitonin of one serial, what does that mean? Does it mean infection? Does it mean no infection? I mean, I don't think you can get much and, information and the other question about your serial measurements maybe in a complicated post-op patient to try to be an early clue that, that something more is going on than a routine post-op course in a complex patient. That was kind of your question. And I think, I think you know, from a lab utilization standpoint, we don't want everybody to order Q-day procalcitonins, you know, just to sort of, oh, it's like as, a, as an early clue. And, and I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know if anybody's looked at it or you looked at this, story, cause, you know, I, I'm sure you couldn't look at every study ever done, but, you know, complicated SICU, you know, I mean, you know, our hospital gets a lot of really complicated sick patients with complicated surgical issues, and then, you know, doing serial procalcitonin measurements in those patients for early detection of an infectious complication. Have you seen anything on that in your... In your yeah, so we're not aware of any literature, Bazu. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. I've seen patients from community hospitals where they give you a value and they say, greater than two, suspect sepsis. You know, 0.5 to two, worry about sepsis. <laughs> Less than 0.5, don't worry about sepsis, right? That's kind of that, you know, that's, I've seen that from, from too many hospitals. So, um, Ellie, do you have a question? And the question, in case you couldn't hear, was a correlation of, of uh, post-calcitonin and other, other inflammatory markers like CRP. I mean, usually inflammatory conditions, CRP would be elevated or sepsis might be elevated, but you mean the magnitude of elevation of CRP and magnitude of elevation of CRP? So it is in general more specific than CRP for bacterial infection, but again, it's not 100% specific. And the diagnostic performance was better than CRP for different fields of um, infectious etiology versus non-infectious etiology. Again, not 100% um, specific. Rania? So the question was sort of a complicated patient, maybe developing some leukocytosis. Would getting a procalcitonin help in your clinical decision making? You mean patients with chronic infections? Yeah. So sometimes procalcitonin may not be significantly elevated in patients with chronic infection. You can see that most of the studies exclude a patient with chronic osteomyelitis or another chronic infection that requires prolonged duration of antivirus. Yeah. So it may not be um, helpful, or you cannot use it as a solo marker to guide antibiotic therapy uh, based on these patients. Yeah. I, I anticipate we're probably going to try to restrict this test for, for de-escalation, not, not initiation. I think that's, I think, um, well, I don't, th I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm getting some dirt. Pro probably not. Exactly. Yeah, doing it once a day. I mean, I mean, the data initiation that, that Nora presented was really interesting in terms of you know, first couple hours, 
And as a Q-day test, I think in general, it, I think in general this is going to be a test to help us de-escalate. Dr. Herjol? I know. No, I think that um, all of us, all of us physicians with gray hair, you know, we always like to say, I mean, we shouldn't practice medicine from a room with a computer. We should go examine the patient and 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 that sort of thing. Right, Doctor Hershel? Uh, <laughs> I know. I mean, I yeah. I I anticipate that. I think there's no question when procalcitonin is rolled out, and it's probably going to be relatively quickly that it'll 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 be. It'll be targeting the ICUs for de-escalation of therapy, and again, the hope is to to, to shorten courses of antimicrobial therapy. That's the goal. And then, w whether we allow it in other settings or not, probably be a discussion we'll have. I I, th I think I'm in favor of it, but you know, it'll be a discussion um, with with the lab and the and and the and the antimicrobial utilization subcommittee. And we have time for one last comment or question. I think I saw one hand. If not, again, I just I can't say how grateful I am uh, for you to do this and you know to come to Department of Medicine, you know, from the world of Rainbow. I know we're you know we're we're a, you know a rough crowd over here in the, in the adult world. So. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Nora. Yeah.